Hello and welcome everyone to the Center for Global Development. I'm Amanda Glassman. I'm a senior fellow and the executive vice president here. Today, I have the real honor to be joined by uh, Julia Gillard and Ngozi Okonjo-Iweala to talk about their new book, Women and Leadership, Real Lives, Real Lessons, and the implications of their findings for the field of global development health. I'll let them give you a sense of the data, uh, but you know from the start, women make up. Um, and they've, they've had some great conversations with some of the most powerful and interesting women. They look at uh, patterns of inequality and access to power. They launch some hypotheses and they discuss uh, their own experiences as well as the experiences of, of these eight women. I think it's eight women but we'll come back to the authors for that. Um, as we go forward, you can submit questions via YouTube or on Twitter using the hash GD talks or by emailing events at cgdev.org. And known authors of Women in Leadership. Julia Gillard was the 27th Prime Minister of Australia and the first woman ever to serve as Australia's Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister. She is of course the the protagonist of the viral video um, where she talks about misogyny in the, in the leader of the opposition. Uh, I encourage you to watch that if you haven't already. Um, and among many other uh, very important positions, she's the chair of the Global Ship for Education um, and as well as the chair of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership at King's College London. And Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iweala, she served twice as Nigeria's finance minister she had a 25-year career at the World Bank, rising to the number two position. She was the chair of the board of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. She's the co-chair of uh, the Global Commission on, Eco on Economy and Climate. And she sits on the board of Standard Chartered, and importantly, Twitter. So further ado, I'll turn it over to our colleagues. Um, one question, uh, when you wrote your book, one thing that you've talked about a lot is, why it's a great idea to take leadership positions in politics uh, or in global development. Let's start with why it's great, and then we'll dive into why it's hard. So uh, let's start with you, uh, Julia. Ngozi, do you want to start? No, Julia, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, I, I'm glad we're starting with the positive. Uh, one of the things that Ngozi and I most wanted to um, make sure came through in the book is that there is great joy in being a leader. Uh, it gives you the opportunity to put your values into action. It gives you the opportunity to make change. And the overall message of the book to women, uh, particularly young women, is go for it. Ngozi always does that with a wonderful punch in the air. So please go for it. For it. And for both of us, I mean, we would say even reflecting back on our careers where we did hit some gendered obstacles, uh, we would still say, look, it's been worth it absolutely uh, to get to do the things that we've done and make big changes for our nation and also get to serve uh, the global community. So uh, the joy in that, the opportunities in that overwhelms the gendered obstacles, but the gendered obstacles should no longer be there and they should should never have been there and they should certainly no longer be there and that is the purpose of the book to help us clear those obstacles out of the way. Excellent. Let me just add, add to that you know, uh, to what Julia said. I, I think you know for me and I, I'm sure for Julia it's been a great honor and privilege uh, to be able to serve. You know you grow up at least I was brought up with the notion that um, giving back and serving others uh, uh, is is the best thing to do. And that if you have education, uh, my father always instilled in us, this isn't for you to make you comfortable. It's also for you to use to make other people comfortable. Now, if you grow up with those notions, then, you know, uh, I mean, how much, uh, how much better than to have a leadership position where you can actually make decisions, um, a, a good policy decisions or political decisions that can impact your country and be in a position to help women. Um, and I'll just give you one example. You know, when I was finance minister of Nigeria, 
the second time around, the first time I was too busy making sure that I got results so people would see that women could do it. The second time around, I think I was a little bit more relaxed, but I suddenly realized that I had uh, p power of the purse in my hands. And instead of talking about mainstreaming women and doing this and that, I could actually do something uh, to help women. And that was to use the power of the budget to, to get my colleagues to um, you know, get results for women in their fields over and above what they would have done. So in agriculture, we're able to get 2 million more women you know, access to fertilizers and seeds and the electronic wallet. Uh, you know, in health, we're able to get operations for 3,000 more women in fistula, and I could go on and on. But, but it's that joy, that privilege that leadership provides. So I, we want to be very positive about it. It's not easy, but it's a good thing. And why not? Why not? Julia also says very often, and we have it in the book, that the brains of men and women are not different. You know, so, so is there something that says leadership is just for men? Our brains are not materially different. So leadership should also be for women. Exactly. So in the book, you start out doing the numbers. Uh, can you give us your assessment on the share of women currently in leadership and our prospects for speedier advancement towards equality of opportunity in the future? Maybe I'll start. One of you. I can yeah. start. Um, you know, the numbers are very, very interesting. I mean, let me start with parliamentarians. You know, today, uh, one in four women, one in four parliamentarians globally is a woman, just a quarter. 21% of all ministerial posts are for women. Um, only 57 countries out of the 193 at the UN have had women leaders. <clears throat> Um, and if you leave the field of politics and move to business, only 6% of FTSE 100 companies have female CEOs, 6.6% of Fortune 500. You look at the field of engineering, only 15% are women. And I'll go to the fun, a fun part that Julia added, which is looking at athletes. And, you know, she, she put down that you know, 900 athletes, sorry, 900 as, um, out of the 100 athletes uh, who are most highly paid, only one, Serena Williams is a, is a woman. And of 900 Nobel Prize winners, only 53 are women. So you could go on and on, but you know, the, the point is that in almost every field that you look at, um, you find that women are disproportionately underrepresented. And that is really the question we ask in the book. You know, why is leadership so gendered? Uh, what, what, what are the things that prevent leader, women from becoming leaders? What are these obstacles and how do they overcome? And, and I, if I could just add to that, uh, absolutely, and Gozi's laid the statistics out, but the other dimension is, you know, if we could do those statistics and say, but the rate of change is really fast, then we probably wouldn't have needed to write the book and we wouldn't need, a, need to be having this conversation. But actually, the rate of change is very slow. And we know from the data that the World Economic Forum puts out every 12 months where they stock take progress on gender equality, uh, they always give us very disturbing statistics like achieving uh, political equality for women is going to take 95 years achieving economic equality, uh, the best part of two centuries. And whilst that bobs around a little bit, it never bobs around in a way which makes you think, gee, we're getting there far more quickly. Uh, so we not only have low numbers, but we have a low rate of change. And that's why we've got to do better in every sense. We've got to be accelerating the rate of change. So what can we do to accelerate the rate of change? You, you've woven together evidence and then the stories of these incredible women in addition to your own stories. What do you see as a couple of things that, that you'd like to see right away? Well, if I could uh, nominate uh, two, I think we need uh, governments to look at every policy and run it through a gender lens, not have a structure where you've got all of the, you know, 
mainstream instrumentalities of government and then you have a women's affairs portfolio or a gender equality portfolio over here. Um, that can be very useful in giving a push to the big machinery of government, but we actually need that gender analysis at the heart of the machinery of government. And Ngozi knows from her experience, I know from my experience that, you know, central agencies, treasuries, finance ministries are very powerful because every government policy uh, they have a view on and no responsible government is going to give a tick to a policy unless it's seen what the impact of that policy is going to be on the government's budget and what the likely economic impacts are going to be. You'd want the same discipline around equality and gender equality. And if we did that, then I think we would see governments radically changing policies and programs in a way that would benefit women and men. And second, and this is at the far more individual level, and we make this case out very clearly in the book, each of us wanders around the world with sexist stereotypes, gendered stereotypes whispering to us in the back of our brains. None of us is immune from that. And if we could get them out of the back of our brains, then uh, we'd live in a world where we were more fairly assessing men and women, and particularly the women who come forward for leadership. So that's a journey of change for all of us. Let, let me add maybe uh, uh, one or two more important ones. For me, it's bringing in men. Uh, what, 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 one, what, what one of the things we, we say in the book is this book is not just for women, it's also for men because their actions men can take. And if they did take them, it would hasten the pace of change considerably. So men have a role to play. They can call out sexism uh, where, where, when, where they see it, help women call that out and, and, and fight that because it's easier for them to call it out. If a woman calls it out, you know, then you're accused of, you know, uh, um, trying to play the female, the gender card. Um, and men can mentor, men can open the way. Look, all these numbers show they're still overwhelmingly in leadership positions. So if they don't work with women and they don't help to open the door, then it won't happen. So immediate action is men, you need to take action. You need to mentor women. You need to open up positions. You need to call out sexism. So that's really very important. Should it be lean out for men? You know, they <laughs> lean tell, out. Us, tell us to lean in. Should they be leaning out? But no, uh, one question for you, following up on uh, Julia's comment about focusing on um, gender equality across the portfolio and, and every policy, you know, sometimes the high value ministries and countries, you know, and before a woman is elected, she's appointed, she can be appointed, um, defense, treasury, and, and some of the women's experiences that you describe go through that route, that they, they get access to these sort of traditionally male strongholds, uh, Ngozi being a, an incredible <laughs> example as finance minister of Nigeria. Can you reflect a little bit on, yeah, I guess, Ernest Sorberg being another example of that in the, in the stories that you looked at, how, how did some of these issues play out? Julia, go ahead. Yeah, when we talk to uh, each of the women, um, I mean, the pathways that they took to power were different, but some of them had deliberately made selections to go into portfolio areas that were traditionally male. So Erna Solberg, who you point to, the Prime Minister of Norway, uh, she talks about how she was mentored, got an opportunity in Parliament. She went into Parliament as a very young woman and the expectation for a young woman who'd been active in the student movement would be, oh, she'll specialise in education. She'll want to go on the Education Policy Committee and the like. And she decided instead deliberately uh, to focus on economic matters and then an opportunity came up to look at defence matters and she took that opportunity. Uh, Michelle Bachelet in Chile, um, she was a medical practitioner and she did serve as Minister for Health, uh, but she also took the opportunity to be Minister for Defence, uh, something that brought her life full circle because, of course, her father was a general, but he died as a result of being tortured by the Pinochet regime, and she ended up as Minister for Defence. So some of the women had deliberately made selections to go into portfolios and to break down barriers from the inside. And I think that's good, but I 
don't think we should say, look, that's got to be everybody's pathway. I mean, ultimately, politics and leadership is about passion and purpose. And, you know, if your passion and purpose is combating domestic violence or improving childcare arrangements, then you shouldn't shy away from that because it's going to be labelled as stereotypically a female portfolio. What we ultimately want to see is that uh, women and men of calibre can come through for any portfolio and they're distributed on the basis of ability to do it and passion to do it rather than gendered preconceptions that, you know, oh, the man's going to get the defence portfolio, whereas we'll put the woman in social services. Just adding to that, um, I, I, I want to just support what Julia said, because if you take the case of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, for example, um, you know, she, she knew that she wanted to be the president of Liberia for the longest time. And through all the travels of being imprisoned, having to leave the country, coming back, uh, she stuck to that vision and, and she came at it from the side of finance. Um, you know, so she had, uh, did her homework, had a lot of things to say and criticisms, even as a junior officer in the finance ministry. And that led to her standing out and being then, you know, promoted uh, to, to deputy and eventually um, minister of finance uh, of, of her country. And, and so I think um, <clears throat> what Julia is saying, I, I, you know, we were trying to show that if the opportunity comes to take these posts that are powerful, don't shy away from, from them, seize them. And uh, maybe we should use this opportunity to talk a bit of the glass cliff phenomenon, you know, where sometimes women are offered these difficult posts when the things are in a mess and the men don't want it. Of course, the men feel they'll have other opportunities. And sometimes women go in for this because they think this is my one chance. So you have, if you're a leader, you have to be willing to take risks, considered risk. I'm not saying foolish risk, considered risk, but if you don't have that appetite to take a bit of risk, then you won't make it. Julia took a lot of risks to make it to prime minister. I took a lot of risks in doing the job. I, and even now I'm taking a great risk to bid for the WTO, you know, putting yourself out there in front of the world. And it, you know, I'm going through all sorts of things, but if you don't, the men take risks. Uh, and, they, and they get to be leaders. So women must have that appetite, but look at the risk you're taking very carefully and make sure it's a considered risk that the chances of getting through are fairly high. Exactly, and, and building on, you, lo you looked at that glass cliff um, issue, uh, but you also looked at uh, a couple of other hypotheses that are driving the numerical lack of women leaders and the ways that they're treated differently from men. So could you talk about a couple of those as well? Um, I was both depressed, but also it's reality that there's this section about that it's about your hair. Your hair turns <laughs> out to be important, as does what you wear. We all know that. And I loved, um, you should read the book, but um, in uh, Julia makes a comment uh, in the book that, you know, many women politicians have to wear certain kinds of suits and certain kinds of colors. You know, some people think that within political parties, but did you ever see Winston Churchill dressed in canary yellow, a solid <laughs> jacket and delivering his big speeches? You know, it just didn't come up. So I'll, I'll go back to you, maybe starting with Ngozi, uh, you know, in terms of these hypotheses that you looked at, is it all about the hair or is, what else is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's all about the hair. You know, one of the, one of the points made in that chapter that I like very much is Hillary Clinton talking about she sh her book should have been entitled or she should have written something called the Strunchy Chronicles. <laughs> it's all about the hair, you know, because uh, she spent so much time worrying about appearance and her hair. And she, this is so, a woman who has traveled to, you know, dozens and dozens of countries all, all over the world as Secretary of State, but she's expected to step out looking immaculate when she arrives in a country and has to worry. People are always fixated on her hair. And of course, the joke is, uh, she, she told me when we were interviewing her, Julia and I, that she really envies me because I have this head, head scarf, um, you know, and so I don't have to worry about my hair. <laughs> Not alone. That, that was an interesting <laughs> angle. 
But to, to talk seriously, what, one of the things we found in, in this uh, hypothesis is that women leaders get scrutinized so much for appearance in ways that men are not. I mean, you know, I'll joke now, perhaps nobody worries about Prime Minister Boris Johnson's hair, but I'm sure that if a woman <laughs> had ruffled hair like that, there'll be plenty of comments. And virtually all the leaders found that their appearance was looked at and scrutinized in the way that men are not. Men have an, a uniform. That's where this uniform thing, they wear a suit. And uh, nobody ever talks about it except once for President Obama when he wore a brown suit and then that became the topic. But otherwise they come in, the women are not the same. So in defense, what some of these women say, in order for people to pay attention to what they're saying, the substance, rather than the form uh, of their appearance, they took to trying to maybe design a look that virtually also became a uniform, whether it's a pantsuit and your hair worn a certain way, or in our part of the world, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf had, and, and Joyce Banda, the president of Malawi had their African costume. And you can see for me, I not only have that, but I devised my own style of headscarf. And so I appear different colors, but the same style. So people are now used to seeing me. And I noticed that oh, she's going to come looking like this. So they don't pay attention to your appearance. They actually listen to what you have to say. From your mouth to God's ears. Julia, <laughs> what about some of the other uh, hypotheses that you took a look at? Uh, well, I want to uh, endorse the Hillary Clinton view that Ngozi's scarf is a miracle device. I've watched her uh, <laughs> tired and she does it in about two seconds flat, which is also amazing. If she gave me the piece of material, I'd still be there 24 hours later trying to get it on. Um, so the appearance we look at is one hypothesis, but we uh, range across a fairly wide terrain. So we uh, talk about the differential focus on family structures for women leaders. You know, if you do have kids, who's looking after them? If you don't have kids, I don't have children. Why don't you? What sort of woman chooses to not have children? Uh, we talk about the foundational influences, what was common in the family homes of each of the women we interviewed. And indeed in our family homes is that uh, girls weren't told you can't do that, that that's only for boys. They weren't hothouse for leadership, uh, but they weren't told, no, that's something that you should never think about. That's only for the boys. And we dig a fair bit into the psychological research about how we see women leaders, uh, which has got ever more sophisticated and clear and tells us that we, because of these sexist whispers in the back of our brains, uh, you know, our predisposition is to look at a woman leader and if she is strong and commanding, we quickly conclude that she's unlikable, that she's probably a bit of a bitch, that she's offending against the stereotypes in our head that women should be empathetic and nurturing. And we explore at some depth the kind of tightrope that that puts women leaders on, that if they look to feminine, you know, girly, whatever, then people will decide, oh, too weak, too emotional for leadership. But if they're on the other end of the spectrum and they're tough and commanding, people will go, oh, I just don't like her. Um, and of course, in democratic structures, if enough people do that, then uh, you're not going to get elected. And this whole thing about nasty women um, certainly played out very strongly around Hillary Clinton in 2016. But you would have seen that it played out around Vice President Harris in the campaign too. The first insult Donald Trump threw at her was that she was nasty and no one liked her, which is a sort of gendered insult from, a, you know, central casting. Um, so we explore all of these um, in both the research terms and how our individual women leaders have felt the impact of them in their own lives. I want to add one point. Um, you know, we don't uh, go a lot into uh, in the book into issues of women of color. And, you know, some women have asked me why we, we didn't do this, um, it, but it could have uh, been um, it wasn't that we didn't want to do it, uh, but I do want to say one thing, and that is that for many of the difficulties that women face in leadership, women of color face them even more. 
They have fewer role models. You know, we have a pecking order in the world of white men, then, then uh, black men, then white women, then black women. And uh, there are very few role models and, and they feel this very keenly. Um, but that being said, there should be no reason why, again, there shouldn't be a bit of risk taken on the part of women of color uh, to rise to positions of leadership. And we see that now in Kamala Harris for all the insults. She took the risk, she went there and she made it. So I just want to strongly encourage women of color also not to stand back. Absolutely, and, and you do uh, call out the experience of uh, UK Labour MP Diane Abbott, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and what you're saying, it was so, and we've witnessed this here in the United States firsthand, just the volume and tenor really very rough on social media and, and threatening. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you can easily see how that would put you off a career in politics. And so double, um, you know, we, I think we have to be doubly impressed when we see, you know, Vice President Harris, when we see your leadership uh, in this space. And I'm glad that, that you're thinking about that. Can I also ask you, you know, there's also, um, the geog geography in the world. And when we look at the leadership of global development health institutions, I know um, you and Gozi are uh, in the midst of a, a process regard with the World Trade Organization. But how do you see these issues play out in global development organizations? Well, you know, uh, Amanda, it's not very different in global development. Let's just, if truth be told, um, you know, the World Bank has never had a female president. The, the United Nations hasn't had one. The World Trade Organization hasn't had one. I think it's even harder in those organizations for, that relate to finance or economic development. We are lucky that the, in the fund, this has finally happened. And, and, and remember, I'll just mention that the US is a little bit behind in finance because you're just getting Janet Yellen, your first finance minister. So Nigeria is a bit ahead and many other countries. So for global, in global health, you also see the same play out. I don't have all the numbers in front of me, but it is very true that you don't see the women leaders, as many women leaders in global health. Uh, as, as you would have. And look, you know, globally, the WHO tells us that about 90% of the, of the uh, nurses in the world are women. On my continent of Africa, it's 75%. You know, you go to doctors, there are fewer women doctors uh, proportionately, I think 40% uh, globally or something like that. But still, those numbers are, are quite impressive, but you don't see that kind of leadership. So uh, it's no different in the health sector and we really need to push uh, to, to make sure that women leaders uh, do, do uh, come up. Excellent, so we'll watch this space. Let me ask you about the issue of unpaid care. So you have a chapter that focuses as, as you're talking about on family and uh, care work and that women you know, sort of st still in the position of juggling both. I really liked your advice uh, in this area, uh, you know, and it's it's a sort of about having real expectations for what happens when when you hit these big jobs. You know, you will feel guilty, <laughs> you will make trade offs, um, but it's going to be okay, and your kids are still going to like you at the end of the day. So maybe <laughs> you can, um, uh, you know, or your spouse or whatever it might be. So uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that issue of sort of unpaid care, how to balance it. Um, with political life or with these high demanding jobs? I, I thought it was, um, uh, I thought it was very telling when we explored this with uh, the women leaders and most particularly with Jacinda Ardern, who's the second woman to ever have a baby while in office. She, she rejected the, the word balance. She said instead that, look, she just finds a way to make it work. But the word balance sort of implied to her that 
everything was carefully calibrated and that, you know, there was an even share between uh, work and home. And of course, life is messier than that. Um, but what she also talked about very clearly is the way that she has organised her family where her partner is the primary caregiver to their child, uh, that many women have thanked her for role modelling that because that is the arrangement in their family, but they've always found it awkward uh, to talk about, you know, to go to a local event and someone asks the male partner in the couple, what do you do? And he's found it quite awkward to say, well, I, I you know, look after the kids. That's what I do. Um, so I think in all of this, um, one of the things that we uh, deal with in the book, but I think we're going to be talking about more and more over the years to come as we emerge out of the pandemic, is the opportunity before us now to have an ever more sophisticated conversation about more equitable sharing of domestic work and better government policies around family support and childcare. Uh, many nations as part of the pandemic have uh, gone to emergency childcare policies. Uh, we in Australia went to a system of free childcare for essential uh, workers because they were needed in the pandemic. And there were lessons learned from that that I think we can take into our childcare policies in the long term. And then there's been plenty of research that has shown that uh, even in families where both partners work full time, male and female partners, even in families where the woman is the highest income earner, domestic labour still disproportionately falls on her shoulders. And in the pandemic, when there was the need for homeschooling, whilst both partners stepped up, she had to disproportionately step up, so ended up with more of the load. And I think we can use that to spark the conversation we need to have about more equitable sharing of domestic labour if we are going to achieve uh, gender equality in other places. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, it's very, can I ask you, um, Ngozi, you know, we've seen through this COVID-19 recession that in some countries it's really, you know, many times recessions send women into the labour market and it actually advances the cause of women's labor market participation. And in this episode, it's had the opposite effect in high income countries, at least from what we've been able to see. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, how women's leadership intersects with this? Well, first let me say that uh, the COVID-19, and this follows very much on what Julia has said, it's not just in high income countries that it's impacted. In low income countries, it's worse because many women work in the informal sector. And when there are lockdowns and closures, you know, these women who earn their, their, their living on a daily basis and often can be heads of households, uh, have no other means. So it's really, really a dire. And it's been very hard on women in developing countries, uh, particularly on my continent uh, as well. But even here in the rich countries, as you said, Amanda, I hear that women are disproportionately leaving the labor force uh, following the pandemic because of all these duties they have to juggle. You know, they have to homeschool the children. Uh, they, they have to take care of them during the day and then trying to do your work at the same time is uh, extremely difficult. And if you don't have the means uh, to be able to afford this, then you make a decision that, look, I can't manage it all. And, and, and therefore I must focus on one thing or the other. The first is no one should be judgmental. If a woman feels she has to drop off to go and, and you know, to take care of her family. But I think that, you know that, I mean, when women, women's work is not counted, um, and, and they are not compensated. That's also a GDP loss to the economy. And that's why some people are arguing that even in this pandemic, women ought to be paid an allowance uh, or something monthly for taking care of the children and doing all the work at home. Um, so that I would support that, you know, um, we have to look at it carefully, what the financial implication or fiscal implications are. Of course, I'm a former finance minister, but the idea that uh, you know, women would feel this burden. Uh, it, it impinges on leadership as well. You know, if you've got to all these things, you've got to do. It's a heavy uh, decision load. Um, the pandemic is, of course, special, but in a way, this is also what feeds into women's minds as to whether they should go for leadership positions or not. Um, can I can I deal with the family? 
and the, and and the work I have, and also be a leader and be out there, and and you know. But I want to end that on a positive note. One is I'd encourage policymakers to really look at this issue of women's work at home, and and see how that can be validated and, if possible, compensated in in countries that can fiscally manage it. Two, um, I would like to encourage women. Um, not to drop out of leader, the prospects of leadership uh, because of all this. You know, there's no right answer. Jacinda then said it all. You make it work. But if, if you can find a partner uh, and, uh, th that is supportive, uh, between the two of you, you can manage it. I have four children and, and uh, my husband was very supportive and we're able to juggle things just like Jacinda, he is a neurosurgeon and a trauma specialist, so he's equally busy, but we, we found a way to make it work. So I think that's one lesson. The second thing I want to say is I have three boys. Women we, and men, we have a responsibility to bring up our sons, to understand that no woman is going to be there doing things for them anymore. They have to be full partners and it starts at home. So that's the other thing you have for future leadership of women. You have to train your men to know that women should not be bearing all this burden because they have to be leaders too. So those are a, a couple of things I just want to add on that matter. Excellent, good advice. So uh, going back to the women that you interviewed, you know, you have um, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf from Liberia, you had Joyce Banda from Malawi, you had Michelle Bachelet from Chile, to Theresa May in the UK, and Ernest Sorberg from Norway. You know, you took, you decided to take this global view of the issue. Can you tell me a little bit about sort of the insights that you gained from looking across um, these women's pathways, you know, beyond the ones that we've already talked about? What else would you say about that were commonalities among all of them? I think it was very important to us in doing the book that we got women from around the world. We set out to do that and we achieved that with the women that you've nominated, Hillary Clinton as well, uh, Christine Lagarde uh, and uh, Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand. So a, a spread right around the world. And we wanted to delve into, uh, you know, how much of a difference does culture and context make and how much is in common simply because the leaders are women. And whilst, you know, experiences varied incredibly, uh, so you can't uh, look at an Ellen Johnson Sirley for a Michelle Bachelet, uh, both of whom lived in exile, Michelle was tortured, Ellen was imprisoned. You can't look at their experiences and say, well, you know, Erna Solberg or Theresa May knows about that because obviously they don't in peaceful countries like uh, the UK and Norway, they haven't had those experiences. And yet there was this central thread uh, that all of the women talked about, you know, focus on appearance, on family, this narrow tightrope uh, between sort of strength and empathy. Uh, these were all shared experiences. And it was right down to the sorts of things where almost every woman in an audience, if we were in a hall together now, would be nodding her head. Experiences like uh, sitting in a meeting and making a contribution, no one responding, and then a man a few uh, turns of the speaking order later saying exactly the same thing and people going, well, that's a fantastic idea. Uh, or, you know, feeling that you've needed to earn your place. Um, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf talks about that even when she was at the level of president, when she went to meet with the other presidents on the continent, she could feel uh, that you know, they were waiting to see how well she did with her speech. And there was not applause or anything like that, but there was an acknowledgement in the, in the eyes that yes, you've passed the test. So even at that level, uh, women have this sense that they don't automatically have the seat at the table. They don't have it as of right. They've got to go through um, a special set of hurdles to somehow be uh, welcomed there. So those very personal behaviours were also something that the women talked about that was very much in common. And the other thing that was really important to us is, you know, it's very hard for women who are at the forefront of politics, whose names are known, to say, look, this happened to me because I'm a woman, you know, because the reaction to that so often will be, 
you know, she got to be president of X or prime minister of Y. Like, what she got to complain about? Why on earth is she complaining? Um, and so the very fact that we asked the same questions to all of these women gave them a bit more space and a bit more permission to speak freely because they knew that it wouldn't be represented as, you know, Jacinda complains about X or Teresa complains about Y, uh, but rather would be received as a collective group of women talking through issues. Just one, one interesting point to add to that very quickly, that I think women who are aspiring to leadership or who are leaders already know, I mean, you know, one big lesson that, that was an interesting one was that the women all felt that none of them really had all the answers and that there's still uh, the issue of self-doubt. Um, you know, so even when you've made it from, from to the top, you know, you're still questioning yourself. You're still, uh, you, you feel like you don't have all the answers. So for those who think once women are at the top, they, they are the oracle. Uh, that is not the case. They continue to ask questions. You know, they continue to be that normal human being. So I'm saying this to encourage everybody. Self-doubt is not a, an obstacle to leadership. You can ask yourself questions, but that doesn't mean you can't be a leader. In fact, it humbles you because if you go into that feeling, you know everything and you're better than everyone. And we've seen examples of that recently. Then you, you may not be the best leader for your country. Yeah, I was going to say that maybe self-doubt is actually a really important quality in a leader. Um, the ability to look critically at your actions and, and take corrective measures. Um, can I ask you, you know, do you see differences uh, on the right and the left when you looked at women who came from across the political spectrum? Any thoughts on that? It, it occurs to me that it actually looks quite similar uh, across the political divides. Julia, I, I, you, think you, you, I think you should answer that because you were from <laughs> the left. <laughs> yeah, I, look, I think it. Um, I, I think it's uh, more similar than people would think. You, we, we wanted to get some balance here. So, if you look across the women leaders, obviously Erna Solberg in Norway is a conservative. Uh, Theresa May uh, from the British Tory Party, um, and and so it goes. Um, and yet their experiences were very much in common with uh, women like myself who come from progressive political parties. But I think there are some nuances, some differences in the way that uh, progressive parties and more conservative parties have been prepared to respond. I think it is fair to say uh, that more progressive political parties have been more likely uh, to adopt quotas or targets to try and get more women through into parliament. That's certainly been the Australian experience, but I think it's true more broadly. Uh, conservative political parties are much more likely to rely on networking, on mentoring, um, on uh, sponsorship, on women's training programs. And I think, you know, there can be merit in all of these things, but, um, you know, from the research that I've seen, there certainly are times when if you're going to rapidly accelerate the number of women who are in parliaments, then you do need to have a structural solution like an affirmative action target to kind of give the big push and make the big change. Um, but it was uh, good to tease that out. And we did have, you know, a good conversation, for example, with Theresa May, who um, in, uh, you know, conservative political party, admittedly, um, it's brought two women leaders to the fore in the United Kingdom, Margaret Thatcher and then Theresa May, but in a conservative political party that when you looked across the full parliamentary team had relatively low numbers of women. Uh, Theresa May had been very active across her political career, creating women's organisations and networks, uh, most particularly uh, a network called Women to Win, uh, which was purpose designed to get more women into parliament representing the Tory party. I mean, it occurs to me that it would be great to be able to do both, right? And maybe, um, you know, what you're saying, sort of quotas, you know, a, a, a propositive or intentional effort to seek equality in representation. Um, and we see that from the US cabinet or like Finland's cabinet. You know, that's really different when uh, we can contrast that to the pictures of 
uh, our previous president's cabinet. Um, but also the networking, mentoring, sponsorship turns out to be quite important um, as an intervention. So it's, I think it's interesting to combine these ideas. Um, and let me ask you a little bit about the research. You, you, I think you make a really great case that this is really a moral issue first and foremost. But there are also these other rationales for why it's great to have women as part of leadership teams or as part of corporate governance. Uh, there's something about corporate profits, et cetera. Can you reflect a little bit on that literature and what are the big findings? Sure. Um, the uh, Global Institute for Women's Leadership, which I chair at King's College London, has just done a literature review. This actually postdates um, uh, our book, but a major literature review working with the uh, Westminster Foundation for Democracy um, and uh, can show through the research that increasing numbers of women parliamentarians um, are correlated with uh, less corruption, uh, with governments that are more focused on uh, social sector policies that make a difference to inequality. So there are, you know, uh, changes of actual uh, policies and outcomes that you can point to. Uh, there is research that shows for uh, corporations, uh, particularly corporations that are consumer facing, um, in societies that increasingly are concerned about gender equality, that uh, more gender diverse leadership means those corporations are more profitable. Uh, there's plenty of research which now shows that diverse teams, diverse in every sense, um, uh, diverse in, in gender, in racial composition, in all sorts of human characteristics, uh, that diverse teams will come up with uh, better solutions and better outcomes. So the research base is all there. But we do make the point in the book that we've got to be a little bit careful about all of this uh, because it's easy uh, because we all like to celebrate women's achievements. It gladdened my heart when the dialogue started that women were leading better during COVID and their nations were doing better in terms of combating the virus. That does glad gladden my heart. But if it's easy to move through that, into a kind of uh, female hero version of leadership where we effectively end up saying, you know, we'll, we will celebrate a woman leader if she's amazing. Meanwhile, all these mediocre blokes still get to be leaders and just do what they do. And if the high jump bar for a woman to become a, a leader is she's got to be absolutely amazing and better at everything um, than anybody else, then by definition, we're kind of baking the sexism in and we're conf confining women to a lesser share of leadership positions because there's only a smaller percentage of people who are ever going to be that amazing. Uh, so we have kind of joked, you know, we'll know that we've hit uh, gender equality when a mediocre woman can do as well as a mediocre man. Um, you know, hopefully, actually, we live in a world where um, terrific men and terrific women come through. But we've just got to be We've got to be mindful of this research and it does give us some arguments, but we can't end up putting the case for gender equality on this foundation stone that it'll be about better outcomes. We've got to come back to the moral case, particularly in politics and say, what kind of democracy is it that would give someone a vote, but say to them, they'll never really get a fair chance to be the leader? You know, what kind of democracy is that? Well, obviously not a satisfactory one. But you, you know, Amanda, just to add to that, um, uh, on the economic side, uh, there are no end of econometric studies that have shown uh, that uh, leaving women out of the economy let's, uh, it, it, it is, makes, it's not good economics. Okay, let me put it like that. And we've got all this research. So I, we also need to be clear that, you know, having diversity, including women and empowering them is very powerful. Uh, you remember the McKinsey study that showed that if uh, women, if we could have gender equality uh, mm -hmm. and have women as empowered uh, as men in the economy, we would add $28 trillion to global GDP. 
So we shouldn't forget uh, on the economic side that it actually makes a great deal of sense to have diversity uh, and, uh, in, in what we're doing. And Absolutely. I want to touch very quickly on um, another point uh, that Julia raised in terms of how we hold women up, maybe expecting them to do much better. Uh, you know, we have to be careful not to judge women leaders by different standards. We found, and we were asking our question, whether when women, a woman leader makes a mistake, and there's a chapter called Modern Day uh, Salem, um, is she held to a different standard than a man making the same mistake? And, and you know, this occurred, we we're just witnessing a lot of women leaders at one time, going through difficult times like Dilma Rousseff, in Brazil, Madame Park in, in South Korea, and on and on, even Hillary during her time here, and wondering whether they were being held to a different and higher standard. And I think gender equality is also when men and women can be held to the same standard uh, of, of, in, in terms of their leadership and behavior, and when women don't have to feel that they have to be twice as good and work twice as hard. So oh, true. Okay, I'm going to share two questions from uh, the live feed. Well, one is a uh, little bit related to what we were just talking about, which is how can we move society and norms towards placing more value on the characteristics associated with women when assessing leadership, things like empathy, self-doubt that we've talked about. Um, another question that's come in is, uh, we aspire to be leaders and have been told by our parents to look up to women like you. And can you share, uh, Dr. Ngozi, some of the platforms, activities, and opportunities through which you provide mentorship for women in Nigeria or, or other resources that you know about? So I'll, I'll go back to you. Sorry. Well, maybe Julia can take the first part. I couldn't actually hear the question on the second part, so you have to repeat it. Oh, Julia, you go first if you heard it. Sure. Um, um, I'm, I'm happy to to uh, uh, to respond. I'm on. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Ngozi will respond on uh, the mentorship that she sought to give women in Nigeria and beyond. But one of the motivations for us in writing the book is both of us get asked, Ngozi in particular, um, to mentor a lot of women, and there is just a you know physical constraint um, as to how many you can mentor. And so the book, in some ways, is a way of helping do that at scale, of giving the the lessons learned and the insights to as many women as possible. Um, on uh, the leadership characteristics, I think this is a really important question and one we delve into in our book. But if I could also re recommend another book to people, we can start a book club with a reading list here. But um, there's a wonderful book written by an Argentinian academic called uh, Tomo, uh, Thomas Chamaro Pre Music. And the uh, book is called uh, Why Do We Keep Promoting Incompetent Men and What Can We Do About It? And I've, I've joked that it's the kind of book that you want to be seen reading in a very public place so that people can wander past and look at the title and wonder what, what you're reading. But he is a business psychologist and he didn't come at this question through the prism of gender. He came at it through... Um, a lot of research about what leadership characteristics are actually associated with better outcomes and success and found that many of the things we intuitively associate with leadership, confidence, charisma, a bit of swagger, uh, that when you actually get all of the data, these things are not correlated with the best outcomes. And actually better outcomes come from people who are more prone to self-doubt, therefore more likely to ask the next question, uh, more likely to draw their team in and rely on the collective view of the team rather than a snapshot judgment that they make themselves. Um, and so, you know, we, we I think need to follow uh, and think through all of that and say, what are the characteristics we're looking for in all leaders? And they are gonna take us away, I think, from the stereotypically male characteristics to historically male characteristics to a broader set of characteristics. And that in and of itself is gonna be good for gender. What I think we've gotta be 
careful about is that we don't, once again, to use Ngozi's words, we don't bake in a differential standard. So we say, look, it's fine for a man to be, you know, self-interested, arrogant, a bit abrupt, um, but, you know, he's a, he's a commanding kind of guy. He's going to get the job done. But we're only going to say a woman can lead if she's empathetic, nurturing, kind, as well as being strong. You know, if, if we want to see empathy, nurturing and kindness in leadership, then we've got to require it of all leaders, male and female, not just differentially put that burden on the shoulders of women. With respect to um, you know what I've done for mentoring uh, in my country and and elsewhere, um, I've what I've tried to do. It's very I take mentoring very seriously, and at any one time I have about ten uh, men, uh, women, and men. You know, there are a couple of men that I'm also young men I'm mentoring. And this mentoring is quite draining, you know, because people want advice when they're making one career move to the other. They want recommendations when they're applying for a job. They want, you know, all along the way. And I do take it seriously. So I pour a lot of myself in it. And what Julia said is true. At any one time, you, if you want to do this well, you can only do take so many people on. So this book, and we, I, it, actually, if you read the part where we talk individually about what brought us to the book. I explicitly say that one of my motivations for wanting to write this book with Julia is, is in a way self-defense, you know, to put some of the, <laughs> I'm very open about it, to put some of the lessons that I've learned, Julia has learned, we've learned from these women out there as part of the mentoring so they can uh, read it because you can't talk to so many people individually, but at any one time, I have about 10, eight to 10 people I'm mentoring even now. The other thing I've tried to do is to be open to speaking to you know, groups brought together by women. Uh, and if you look online, I'm sure you'll see very uh, recently that I've, done, I've been doing that uh, um, to these groups trying to reach out, it's a kind of mentoring by sharing uh, lessons learned. So when women approach me to talk to their groups, of course, within reason, I've tried to do that in my own country. And I'm also involved with uh, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf in her effort to groom uh, political leaders for the continent. She started a foundation and she has a program called Amuje, which brings women spe specifically for leadership uh, training in politics and I'm, I'm on the board and we have sessions with these women. So I think, you know, I try to do a lot personally, but you know, there's so much you can do when you've got a job and you've got other things. So <laughs> speaking of the multitasking, so uh, I encourage everyone to read the self-defense manual uh, and portable <laughs> mentorship uh, tool. Um, can you say a little bit, one of you about how, where, where to find your book and, um, what other kinds of activities you'll be doing to uh, carry out outreach around the book? We do well, have a big program of events over coming days. I hope you're not going to uh, require us to remember them in order because I'm certainly not up to that. It's uh, <laughs> almost 2 a.m. here in Australia, but our publisher uh, in the U.S. is MIT. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the uh, book is, you know, available um, uh, through MIT and, and bookstores. Uh, and we, we're, we're delighted to be able to be out there and uh, talking to people about it. Uh, it launched in other markets around the world at an uh, earlier time. So Ngozi and I have uh, done many of these things in Australia, in the UK and so many other places. And it's always great to have the conversation. Thank you. Amanda, sorry, yeah. we can add that Politics and Prose uh, here as a bookstore that is carrying the book. And Penguin is also a distributor in the US, I think. But there's always the ever-present Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Amazon is the way. It's all there. Let's end um, just with a plug for Ngozi's up for a very big job right now. She's extremely well qualified and in my view the right person. Um, what do we can we what should we look for uh, in the next weeks uh, with regards to your candidacy to the World Trade Organization? <laughs> 
Um, you know, it's a little bit out of my hands. Um, I think we have to be very patient and I call it practicing strategic patience. So um, this has been a very interesting journey, a bit of a risk in, in doing it, uh, but I think we need to wait uh, for the Biden administration to settle down a, a bit. I think people are forgetting they've only been in office a couple of weeks. So um, I, we need to give them a little bit more time. Um, I, I think the situation is trending positive, but I think they'll need the time to be able to make this decision. And I'm trying to be very respectful of the process in the, in the United States and, and follow whatever process they used to make their decisions. Yes, <laughs> it's only day 14. We forget that because every day <laughs> is a year in this time period. Well, thanks to both of you for writing such a wonderful book and for your own lived example. Uh, it's, it's really an honor to learn more about you and this work. And I wish you the best with the promotion and to welcoming you both back uh, to talk about our usual topics in mm -hmm. education and global development, global economics. So thank, thanks so much to both of you. Thank you, thank Amanda. Thank you for a great conversation. Thank yeah, thank Bye. you, Amanda. <laughs>